Costa Rica and was the former Deputy Permanent Representative at the Permanent Mission of Costa Rica to the United Nations. He's a professor of political science at the University of Costa Rica, and he's also been uh, involved in many a number of awards. And again, you've probably had a chance, if you haven't, be sure to, to read through his, his bio and his credentials. Um, I had the chance to, to meet him most recently in, uh, in this past April when our first Global Diplomacy Study Abroad program was able to uh, go to the permanent mission of Costa Rica. Um, he's uh, been gracious with his time, and again, I apologize for the, the trouble in getting, getting to here, but please, uh, I hope it's okay, we're just gonna forego with the opening prayer so we can, uh, some of the students will have to leave in about 15 minutes, um, but please join me in welcoming uh, Ambassador Jairo Hernandez. Thank you. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Sorry for the delay by my flight. Got in 45 minutes late. Um, well, thanks for being here. And I don't know, I, I have some familiar faces of those who served missions in Costa Rica and in, in New York where I was. But other than that, has anybody else been to Costa Rica? Yeah, just for any other purpose? No? OK. Okay, as you can see, Costa Rica is a very small country in Central America, you know, limits Nicaragua, Panama, uh, the Pacific Ocean, the Caribbean Sea. We are about the size of um, uh, Vermont and New Hampshire combined, and San Jose is the capital city, and a population of 4.5 million, of which probably 10% are immigrants, mainly from Nicaragua. Costa Rica is a tropical country with two seasons. We don't have four seasons like, like you do here. It's mainly six months of a lot of rain and six months of dry season. We are in the middle of the rainy season right now. However, despite of its small size, Costa Rica is very diverse. Um, around approximately 2% of the world's biodiversity is in Costa Rica. So you, you can see that we are very blessed with that. And we have all kinds of climates, including high volcanoes, high mountains. The highest peak is 12,530 feet, which you can assume it's very cold, and you can climb there with a special permit. And it is one of the two points in which you can see both the Atlantic and the Pacific. You know, it's the only two spots in the world are in Costa Rica where on one side you can see the Pacific, on the other side you can see the Caribbean. Well, Costa Rica's name was given by Christopher Columbus on his fourth trip to the Americas, 1502, uh, when he landed on what it's called Puerto Limon today. Uh, he saw the beauty of the palm trees and the sand and the water, and he thought this must be a rich coast. And that's why Costa Rica was named after Christopher Columbus' remarks at that time. Um, for three centuries, Costa Rica was part of the uh, kingdom of Guatemala, which was the colonial uh, kingdom belonging to Spain. And in the 19th century, we became independent with the rest of Central America. Very early, we developed uh, very democratic convictions, you know, which was very unusual in the Latin American context. Uh, for example, the literacy rate is one of the highest in Latin America, 96% according to the United Nations. Mainly possible due to a uh, mandatory public system that covers uh, elementary, middle school, and high school. As I said before, Costa Rica became independent from Spain with the other four Central American nations in 1821. I don't know if the newspapers uh, mentioned something like a week ago, Mexico celebrated 200 years of, of independence, 1810. 
Costa Rica's turn will be in, in 2021 with the other republics of the original Central America, Guatemala, El Salvador, Honduras, and Nicaragua. Panama is not included in that group because Panama was part of New Spain, which was a separate kingdom, part of Colombia, and Panama gained in its independence from Colombia in 1903 when the U.S. started to build the Panama Canal. Um, for three years after the independence from Spain, the all five republics of Central America became part of Mexico under the empire of Iturbide. And from 1824 to 1838, we form uh, one country, the Federal Republic of Central America, an experiment like the one you had here in the 19th century when the United States began to expand all the way to the West. In our case, that failed, that didn't succeed. And in 1838, the five countries split and Costa Rica became then an independent nation. Uh, however, very early we uh, were kind of different. Our leadership uh, um, decided to take a democratic path. Our first leader during the regional cycle was a teacher. And our first head of state in 1838 already stressed the importance of rule of law and civilian rights. On the left, you can see the flags of the five Central American nations. Costa Rica is the one to the top with the red color, which was designed by a first lady in the 19th century uh, following the colors of the French flag. Coffee became one of the main exports of Costa Rica in the 19th century. In fact, was the main producer of Costa Rica when the early elites, the oligarchic elites of Costa Rica started to export coffee mainly to England and other European countries. Uh, that uh, influence, political influence of the coffee brokers was broken in, in 1889 when a democratic constitution was adopted. Uh, since then, Costa Rica uh, began the path to become one of the best functioning democracy of Latin America. Among other things, 1877, the death penalty was abolished. So, for example, if somebody kills uh, another person in Costa Rica, he cannot be sentenced, sentenced to, to death. I mean, maybe uh, jail for life or anything, but not death penalty. And in 1889, the first true democratic election took place. And that's why in 1989, when President Oscar Arias wanted to celebrate 100 years of democracy, he invited all the presidents of the Americas. And at that time, President George Bush Sr. came to Costa Rica for that celebration. Costa Rica has long emphasized the development of democracy and respect for human rights. And that's why the country's political system has steadily developed, maintaining democratic institutions and an orderly constitutional sequence for government uh, succession. Several factors uh, can be considered for that. Um, a kind of more responsible leadership than in other countries, uh, comparative prosperity, flexible class lines, educational opportunities for the people that have created a, a stable middle class, and high social indicators. Costa Rica's human development indicators are practically as high as those in developed countries. For example, life expectancy in Costa Rica is higher than here in the US, so almost as high as in Japan, more than 80 years old. Um, one of the factors that explain that uh, evolution of Costa Rica's successful human development indicators is the, the fact that Costa Rica has no standing military since 1948. And you can understand that by not having to spend a lot of money in the military as other Latin countries did or still do, but of course we were able to invest that money in the people, you know, in education, in culture, in health, and other things. Then we have a cycle from 1870 to 1940 where a new era of leadership and functioning democratic institution evolved. And the countries became involved in the world economy, largely becoming dependent on coffee and bananas until the late 20th century, and I will explain that later. In the early 40s, a conservative president introduced social reforms, including the recognition of workers' rights and minimum wages, which was very advanced for that time. In 1948, we experienced a six-week civil war over a disputed presidential election. That was the last interruption we had to the democratic cycle. The winner of the war, Don Pepe Figueres, very famous, to the point that in the, at the end of the 20th century, on a survey conducted to all Costa Ricans, by far Costa Ricans decided that Don Pepe was the person of the century by 70% you know, over others. Um, Don Pepe laid the foundations of a modern welfare system that proved to be very successful for the next 30 years. We established a new constitution with check and balances and gave women and the people of African descent the right to vote. 
and Don Pepe is the responsible for abolishing the armies in, in the army in 1948. So Costa Rica. Yeah, there were uh, an important factor on, from, on the government side, but remember that insurgents won the civil war. And so when the insurgents won the civil war, they decided that the army wasn't needed anymore, that Costa Rica was a small country that we could evolve without an army, okay? Contemporary Costa Rican society was shaped by the political system that emerged after the brief 1948 events, you know? Uh, Don Pepe and, and, and his leaders were kind of social democratic oriented in the European tradition, you know, and one of their goals was to transform the country's coffee and banana based export economy and to break the elite's oligarchic monopol monopoly of political power. The new leaders also built on the social reforms enacted during the first part of the 40s, and the victorious leaders created the conditions to ensure a middle class based society with a social security system that privileged education, health, and infrastructure. For example, up to now, 95% of the Costa Rican people are covered under a universal health care system, which has some inefficient things. I mean, nothing, not all the things work, but at least people have access, you know, in case of they need. For example, I was checking my bank account three days ago because my salary was deposited, and of course, out of that salary, I get a lot of a percentage deducted that I don't see. Part of that salary goes to the healthcare fund. The employer does the same thing. And whether I use it or not, I mean, it's there. If I need it someday, I will use it. If not, somebody else will use it. It's, this system works based on a principle of solidarity, okay? The Constitution of 1949 brought a new distribution of power with checks and balances. We created a fourth branch, you know, traditionally, in the Montesquieu tradition, you know, we have executive, uh, legislative, and judiciary branch. We added a fourth one, which is the electoral court. So our elections are supervised by independent electoral judges. You know? And the Constitution of Costa Rica reflects our attitude of reserve approval of government, and we fear concentrated power. And we believe that law is essential to the order and legitimacy of social reality. What has happened in the country in the last 25 years? I mean, I, I said that before that the welfare state was very successful until the late 80s. At the end of the 80s, things began to change. I mean, with the coming of the global economy and, and other situations, Costa Rica began to transform its export model to the fact that other non-traditional exports were added, you know, to replace, co not to replace, but to, in, in addition to coffee and bananas. For example, Costa Rica is the top pineapple producer of the world you know, right now, and melon, fresh flowers that are shipped to Miami every day. But I don't know if you can guess what is the main export of Costa Rica right now. I mean, it's nothing to do with fruits or vegetables. It's actually Intel microchips, you know, computer. Since 1997, Intel established a plant in Costa Rica which employs 3,000 workers. You know, and around Intel, we have formed a cluster of high-tech services. So Costa Rica's economy now it basically relies on services, high-tech industries, and tourism. Okay. In the 80s, Costa Rica suffered the effects of a Cold War confrontation. At that time, the Soviet Union and the United States were still the big powers, and Central America was a test case of the confrontation between the two super world powers. You know? and, uh, Costa Rica was being affected. We were not involved in the war, but having a war north of our borders, Nicaragua and El Salvador, Guatemala, that was bad for our tourism, bad for our investments. And then our president at that time, Oscar Arias, I mean, decided to uh, propose a peace plan, you know, that in the end was very successful because brought elections in Nicaragua in 1990, where the Sandinistas were ousted of power, uh, was able to, to bring the peace agreements in El Salvador in 1992 and the peace agreements of Oslo, Norway, in Guatemala in 1996. President Arias was awarded a Nobel Peace Prize because of that in 1987. That after the regional conflicts ended at the end of the 80s, at the beginning of the 90s, we had new realities and opportunities. Right now we have a balanced mix between a state and market policies. I mean, Costa Rica has been a country with a very 
important role for the government I mean, during the welfare state. In fact, we are the only Latin American country right now where the telecommunication system is still state-owned. Thanks to the free trade agreement that we all Central American countries signed with the United States a few years ago, that's about to change. So in a few months, we will have uh, telephone companies from other countries, same as insurance companies. Until now, the government has owned those institutions. You know? Tourist boom, maybe 25 years. It was very common to confuse Costa Rica with uh, or Puerto Rico. You know? But nowadays, everybody knows where Costa Rica is because it's a nature-oriented uh, popular destination you know, in all magazines. And people just uh, go there for eco-adventures, nature-oriented adventures. We have put a new emphasis in sustainable development and environmental protection since the 90s. And we have become a service-based economy with a focus on foreign direct investment and high-tech industries. I began my new job uh, two months ago, and you know, I, have, I have the main support of the foreign minister right now. And one of our main priorities now is Asia Pacific. On this trip, this is my third week of travel. You know, during our first week of travel, I was with my minister in Japan and Korea. And next month, we will be in Qatar, India, and Singapore, and China. Because Asia Pacific, we want to focus a lot for foreign direct, men, direct investment and high-tech industries. Uh, we established relations with China instead of Taiwan three years ago. And very rapidly, China is now our second trade partner and probably will become number one instead of the US in a few years. So you know, that's what China is China, you know? <laughs> and a more strategic involvement with the rest of the world. Political system, you know? We have a presidential system like the US, but we vote directly for the president. Popular vote counts. 40% is needed to win the presidential race. If mm, the parties don't reach 40%, we have to go to a second runoff election. That has happened only once in 2002 when the parties, no, no party was able to reach the minimum 40%. We have two cycles of the uh, political party system since 1948. The first stage was a strong party, the Green and White, which is in power right now, and a main coalition of forces. From 82 to 98, we had a classic bipartisan system like the one you have here in the States, two main parties. And from 2002 and 2010, we are in a transition to a multi-party system with one main party, the Green and White, which is now in its second term in power. We don't have consecutive re-elections, so we might re-elect the same party, but with a different president, you know? And two other emerging political forces and one declining party. 2010 election, last February, we had a, the, la the last presidential election with a 70% turnout, you know? It is high, but used to be even higher, you know, 82% in, in, uh, in the past decade, you know? The voters supported the continuity of the same party with a renewed leadership. The ruling party obtained 47% and the main opposition parties 25 and 21%. For the first time in history, we elected a woman as president. So Costa Rica is now the other only country besides Argentina that has a woman as president. She was in New York last week, you know, at the United Nations. So myself and my boss, we were supporting her, you know, and providing inputs for her in her speeches, in her uh, other things. She was privileged to speak number five in the first session of the United Nations. Now, traditionally, Brazil is number one, President Obama was number two, and Costa Rica was number five this time. So she was very privileged. In fact, at the launch that Secretary General Ban Ki-moon offered to all heads of state, at some point in a different table, President Obama came to her to say hello to her and invited her officially to come to Washington next year. She will also do the same thing invited by the Emperor of Japan next year as a state visit. Uh, some s final slides about what is our voice in the world. You know, since you can imagine that since we don't have an army, we have to speak up for similar things at the international level. So. We go for disarmament and non-proliferation. We are, especially at the UN, we are firm advocates of disarmament, both conventional and nuclear weapons. During our presidency in the Security Council in November 2008, we sponsored a high-level debate strengthening the regulation and reduction of armaments. We are one of the leading countries to co-sponsor initiatives towards non-nuclear proliferation and one of the leading sponsors of an arms trade treaty. This is a quote by former president Oscar Arias, the same one who won the Nobel Peace Prize in the 80s and who was president until four months ago. And it's, it's very interesting when he says, what is the great enemy of Latin America that leads it to spend $165 million a day on weapons and soldiers? He asks himself. 
I assure you that these threat, threats are far less significant than the threat posed by, for example, the mosquito that carries malaria. They are less than the threat posed by drug cartels and street gangs that sustain themselves thanks to an unrestricted market of small arms and light weapons. We also voice for international justice and the fight against impunity. For example, we systematically support bringing those uh, cases of leaders, especially in Africa, that should be indicted under international criminal court rules, you know, like the president of Sudan, who has committed a lot of killings and genocides. I mean, so when we were in the Security Council for two years, I mean, uh, of course, the Sudanese ambassador there at the UN didn't like us, but, you know, we are firming our convictions, I mean, for, for against impunity. I mean, if somebody does something that it's not supposed to do, well, we'll, we'll fight for that, you know. We support the International Court of Justice, and in essence, I mean, we stress always the importance of international justice as a way to preserve peace and the uh, democratic international community. Also, we try to protect human rights, uh, take care of humanitarian issues, and the fight against terrorism. Uh, we are a firm advocate of that, and you can see some examples. For example, we chair right now the Human Security Network in, at the UN. Uh, we are very firm advocates of humanitarian assistance in conflicts in order to protect civilians, children, and especially cases against sexual violence in, in the case of wars. Uh, we want an active role in peacekeeping and support also peace building. And of course, security sector reform, which is promotion of reconversion of the military sector and the elimination of armies. Thanks to the Costa Rican example, other countries like Panama have followed. Panama doesn't have an army anymore. A final component of our foreign policy is human sustainable development and environmental pro uh, protection. I don't know if some of you have read about the Earth Summit in Rio, 1992 which gave a new you know, emphasis to s sustainable development concepts and, and environmental issues. You know? As a result of that, two conventions emerged, the Climate Change Convention and the Biodiversity Convention. It's very obvious that Costa Rica will try to, to defend or protect all biodiversity-related issues because for us it is a, a plus you know, to defend our fauna and flora you know, and all kinds of species. And in the, in the case of climate change, we aspire during the 200 years of our independence to become carbon neutral. We'll be one of the first countries to become car carbon neutral in the world. That's the, in other words, to be net, net zero carbon emissions, either ourselves or by, by doing some uh, offsets with other countries that need to reduce their emissions. You know? And it won't be easy to, to attain that goal because still we have some challenges in transportation. For those who live in Costa Rica here and who experience buses know how hard it is to smell all the polluting buses and all that. So we still have uh, some things to do in that regard, but we are working in that direction. What to do from here into the future? You know, Costa Rica has been a relatively successful country. So when you have a successful case, you say what to change, but the world has changed. I mean, we are in a global economy, and so it's, it's hard for people to decide when to change because we need to make a balance between the past successes and the timely changes that we need to undertake nowadays. How to be competitive in a global economy? Uh, and we define sustainable development with three components, macroeconomic stability, sustaining human development indicators, and fostering a strong alliance with the environment, with nature. We need to reach a long-term vision in a fragmented political society, especially that the power of interest groups has increased, and, you know, and that's a big problem sometimes. And we have to cope with pending poverty, crime, and insecurity. I mean, remember that uh, Colombia was very big with drug cartels, then they were transferred to Mexico, and in a way, Central America is sandwiched between Mexico and Colombia, and more and more, we are experiencing the problems of insecurity as a result of the of the works of organized crime in these countries. We need to reinvent education in a changing and demanding world. That's why, that's why we are trying to introduce uh, the teaching of additional languages, you know, not just Spanish, but also English and other possible languages because that's a, a big need in, in, in these times. We need to strengthen and modernize our political system and institutions. We still have some imperfections. We need to have a creative and innovative leadership. 
We need to sustain a necessary long-term vision to, su to succeed in the modern era. Somebody was telling me the other day that my president that I used to work for in the 90s, uh, at some point he was saying, you know, by the year 2020, Costa Rica has to be like this or do something like this. Well, an American consultant came to Washington and, and told him, stop doing that. I mean, you will harm the, the result of the next election for your for your party, you know, stop saying that in 2020, in 2050, you know, uh, you have an election in two years. I mean, but that's the problem, you know. I mean, short-term priorities for a long-term vision. Countries like, for example, like Korea and Singapore, I mean, were able to to attain a lot of success because they were thinking in a long-term fashion. You know, uh, during this trip to Korea, they show us pictures of how Korea was 50 years ago. Korea was poorer than Nicaragua, which is the poorest country in Central America right now. And 50 years later, Korea compares to any other developed countries with a $20,000 per capita income. And finally, we need a national vision without forgetting that we are part of our region. I mean, Costa Rica is part of Central America. And although we may have different developmental structures or, or Things, for example, Costa Rica is 10 times richer than Nicaragua, but that doesn't mean that we cannot work together. You know, we, we are in the same geographic region, and in such capacity, we need to, to, to attain goals. Otherwise, I mean, because that, that's how the world uh, sees us, you know, as part of a region. So if there, are, if there are conflicts or problems in our neighboring countries, in a way, they affect Costa Rica. And um, well, this is what I wanted to share with you. So I don't know if there are any questions. Sorry that I had to to go very very fast. But I don't know if there are any questions or concerns. Yep. Sure. Yes. Both. I mean, during informal visits, for example, when we went to Mitsubishi and Toyota in Japan or, or to visit uh, some Korean private industries, English becomes the common language. But in the meeting with the very top officials, for example, when my minister met with the foreign minister of Japan, you know, Japanese are very formal. Probably there is no other country in the world that follows protocols so strictly, you know, in times that you have to be there on time and you have, I mean, I mean, when we were driving to the ministry 20 minutes earlier, they are calling our car to see if we are going to get there strictly on time. You know, they're very formal. So in those conversations, I mean, they provide their interpreters so it becomes Japanese and Spanish. They speak in Japanese because they don't want to make mistakes or misinterpretation. And we speak Spanish with an interpreter in Japanese. Our embassy in Japan has a Japanese Costa Rican woman who speaks fluently Japanese and Costa Rican. So we use her, but she was so nervous in, our, in the meeting with our foreign minister of Japan that at some point, it's very hard for Japanese to translate, especially numbers, you know, from Spanish to Japanese. So she was a little bit confused and she was nervous. She kind of wasn't sure what she was saying at some point. So in the end, you know, because she has lived in Japan all the time, when Japanese people feel that they have made mistakes, they feel very embarrassed, you know, and so she was telling to my minister, I'm very sorry, I'm very sorry, you know, like thinking that she was going to be fired because of that, <laughs> you know. Okay, second question. Second question. I know the mission is Ukraine. Uh -huh. I'm interested in, I'm a, I'm a citizen of Ukraine, so I was born in 1986, so I don't know a lot about early years of Cold War and their, other than what happened in Cuba. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering, did, did the, the Soviets actually occupy Costa Rica? No. No, they, the only country where they had influence until the 80s was Cuba. You know, when Fidel Castro uh, was victorious in his revolution at the end of the 50s, in the early 60s, Cuba, once they declared a communist country, they became a satellite of the Soviet Union. You know? And that lasted until the end of the Cold War, you know, with the fall of the Berlin Wall, when the Soviet Union disintegrated and Ukraine became an independent country years later and all that. So Cuba was kind of the, under the influence of the Soviet Union. But through Cuba and then Nicaragua to a certain extent during the Sandinista regimes in the 80s, uh, 
Soviet Union was trying to, to gain something, you know, in the waters of the American backyard, because of course we have been traditionally in the 20th century a region of strong American influence. Of course, right nowadays we don't have the communist threat anymore, but we have leaders like Hugo Chavez in Venezuela who have become, you know, an important influence in countries like Cuba or Nicaragua or Ecuador and Bolivia. That doesn't mean that we cannot talk to them. For example, Costa Rica, we import our oil from Venezuela. So whether we like Chavez or not, we cannot be very nasty to Chavez because otherwise our cars cannot drive, you know, on our streets. So, you know, we have to play with all those politics, you know. We have disagreements sometimes in what he does. But for example, we are pragmatic too. I mean, for 40 years, all Latin countries followed the US in breaking relations with Cuba after the revolution. Uh, we decided last year to open again relations with Cuba. And the Cuban ambassador presented credentials to President Laura Chinchilla uh, a month ago and in a very cordial uh, way. And we feel that, you know, no matter that we disagree on ideological grounds, I mean, we, we have to be friends with, with Cuba as well. Okay. Well, it's hard because in a global economy, you see that you have a lot of multinational companies, you know, taking over. I mean, for many years we had a small businesses where we call pulperias, where you go and buy candies or groceries in the little towns. You know, more and more they disappear. You know, the local supermarkets they are basically when the owners feel that they find a timely opportunity. One of the main supermarket chain of Costa Rica has just been purchased by Walmart, for example, you know, three years ago. So in three years, all those supermarkets will be named Walmart Costa Rica, you know. And so, well, it's hard. Tourism at least brings some economic boom, you know, to, to locals. Sometimes, not necessarily because the big hotel chains and others, you know, are foreign, but still there is some room for, for local benefit, but it's not, it's not easy. No, it's not bad for the economy. I mean, it's, it's better to have tourism than not to have it. I mean, it's, uh, it provides a good value added. I mean, we have two million visitors a year. I mean, for a small country of 4.5 million uh, uh, people, having two million visitors a year is, is a really good thing because our tourists come to Costa Rica mainly from the US, Canada, and Europe. They spent a lot of money in Costa Rica. I mean, they, you know, in average, they stay one week, staying, spending hotels and food, and so that that's beneficial for the economy. In the absence of an army, we we rely on the multilateral organizations. For example, two or three times we were threatened by our neighbors. And we didn't have an army, so we went to the Organization of American States, which has a rule that in case of an aggression to one country, the other countries have to come and defend that country. You know, unfortunately, we haven't needed to, to, to do that. And in the case of the drug activity, the organized crime, we have signed agreements with the US other European countries to patrol the waters in the Caribbean and in the Pacific. So it's kind of a joint effort, you know, without, I mean, but our generations, including mine, that we were born without an army in Costa Rica, we don't feel that, that we need an army. I mean, that we can go by without it. Well, in general, US and Costa Rica have been very, have had very friendly relations. 
One factor explains that. Costa Rica has been one of the very few Latin countries that never experienced a military intervention from the US in the 19th century. You know, other countries resent you know, from the US those interventions and put dictators you know, in, in, in the area like Cuba, Mexico, Nicaragua, the Dominican Republic. Costa Rica never experienced that. And since we never experienced that, we never developed those unfriendly relations towards the United States. So in general, we have been supportive of US initiatives in general, you know, whether it is to preserve peace and stability in other parts of the world. However, in the last 20 years, I mean, people, as, as we are more in, in touch with the global efforts, I mean, television, cable, internet, all those things, Costa Rican people have become more aware of things. And so they have gained a more personal opinion and not just follow you know, what other countries do. Um, Afghanistan looks like kind of far. I don't think that pe people are kind of indifferent. With the Iraqi war, our president at that time decided to, to follow the US in the coalition you know, against the war in Iraq. Costa Ricans didn't like that in general. I mean, 90% of the people didn't like the move of the Costa Rican president at that time because people felt that the war was very controversial. That, that wasn't really like a good thing for, for the world. I mean, there were different opinions, but in general, that the Iraq thing was very controversial in Costa Rica. There are other areas, for example, all what the US does against Iran or North Korea, we support. In fact, last week, when the US and the European Union countries walk out, when the Iranian president was speaking, we did too. I mean, and we did it not because of pressure from Israel or from the US, we did it because we feel that it's not as acceptable for a president of the United Nations to talk in those terms about other nations like the US or Israel. It's a hard balance, you know, to achieve that. For example, many people wonder when they go to the Monteverde rainforest why the road is not paved. I mean, some people say, well, it should be preserved that way to preserve the charm of getting there, you know, the way it is. You know, it would be, I mean, the whole enchantment would be lost. So we really have to, to be very careful. I'll give you one example. You know, for example, Costa Rica depends, 90% of our electricity fortunately comes from water. So we don't depend on nuclear plants or oil-based uh, plants or things like that, like other Latin countries or, or even developed countries. Because we, we have been blessed with a lot of water, uh, geothermal and wind power. You know? So that, that's a good thing. But our population is growing, our industrial uh, uh, possibilities are growing. So sooner or later, we need to build more dams. And there are a couple of projects that are going to, are planned for the southern part of Costa Rica. And there is kind of a controversial issue on the table right now. Because if you build one of those dams, a big lake will be created that will practically disappear the few Indian reservations that there are with a lot of their nature. So what to do, you know? So it's kind of a progress versus the preservation of the local culture and the local nature. Sometimes, well, it's, it's hard to make that decision. So far, Costa Rica has been able to, to balance both ways. And that's why things in Costa Rica go slower than in other countries, because we want to take into account the opinions of everybody and all that. I mean, we just don't, I mean, things are slow in Costa Rica because people just, Everybody has to say something about it, not like in other countries that there's, there's strictly no controls. I mean, Costa Rica is probably the country in Central America with the stronger institutions, you know? That means that we have institutions for everything, you know, to control budget here, to control the political power here. In a way, that slows things, but in a way, it's good, it's healthy.
to to have such kind of democracy. Curry. Well, in a way, you are right. You are right in, in, in some cases, because a small country like Costa Rica does not have a strong influence in, in the big issues. In other things, at least, we can bring our voice on certain issues when we protect human rights, when we, when we speak in favor of disarmament and things like that. Sometimes, little by little, you are able to put a word here in this resolution, a word there. And because of that persistence, of that perseverance, Costa Rica is highly respected when that happens. But at the same time, we are realistic. When we were in the Security Council, I remember that at some point, you know, when North Korea launched one of those missiles to test, uh, you know, the reaction of South Korea and Japan and the United States, uh, I remember that the Security Council was immediately, you know, um, invited to 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 for a session, you know, an emergency session. We were in the Security Council at that time. And one of our experts, when, you know, five countries really have to say something about Korea, which are North Korea, which are South Korea, US, China, Japan, and Russia. You know, those are the five countries that really have to say something about it. So one of our experts tried to introduce some language in the resolutions until my ambassador, you know, with more experience and said, Why, what are you doing? I mean, wh wh where do you think you are going? I mean, nothing will happen. I mean, you think that for three weeks, those five countries are been meeting, closed doors, and they will bring a project of resolution just for us to vote yes or no. I mean, there is no way that we can influence on a case like that. So Costa Rica has been able to wait when we can do something and when we cannot. I mean, there are cases like the Middle East or North Korea, Afghanistan, where we know that our voice is very limited. But there are other cases in which there are some things at stake regarding human rights, regarding environmental protection, regarding humanitarian issues, where at least our voice is respected because we have persevered to defend our convictions and our points. So that has been, in general, our position the United Nations. So my experience there, the two years that I was there, is that Costa Rica is, despite of, of its uh, limited influence and despite of its small territory and, and small population, is a country very respected because oh, they know we don't have an army, we know we have a, a very old democracy, and we know that when we speak about certain issues, I mean, we will defend those issues because we, we, we have a, uh, moral authority. That's our power lies in the moral authority, in the moral power, not in the effective power of of the military or or, or being a big power like others. Mm -hmm. well, uh, my next question is concerning trade. Um, you mentioned the two trade agreements that you know were passed a few years back. But when I was in Costa Rica, that was a big deal, and public opinion was, uh, you know, from what I perceived, against it very much so. And yeah, in the end, was half and half. The yes. The yes for the free trade agreement was 51% and the no 48%, so barely passed. Yeah, so we, I mean, we've seen no to two out of three other right now. Yeah. I mean, how has public opinion changed? I mean, has it been beneficial to your economy to have free trade? Or? Well, it's hard to say because we haven't seen the results yet. I mean, supposedly, I mean, we are supposed to have more American products with no taxes and things like that, more Costa Rican products in the U.S. with no taxes here. Uh, but in general, the big impact will be when, when the telecommunication systems and the insurance systems are open up to competition. That will be the big, big challenge, and, and, and we will see then the results. Because so far, people, I mean, the people, the Costa Ricans' main concern at that time of why not to follow the free trade agreement was that we were going to lose the benefits of our welfare system. We just signed a free trade agreement with China. It will go into effect very soon. It has to go to the Congress for ratification. Two months ago, all Central American countries just 
sign a similar trade and political association and cooperation agreement with the European Union, with the 27 countries of so the European Union. That was also a very hard, tough negotiation. Now the trade part will go into effect relatively soon. The political and cooperation part has to be ratified by the Congresses of all Central American countries and by the Congresses of all 27 European Union nations. We also have a free trade agreement with Singapore. We have free trade agreement with Mexico, with Canada, with Chile, with the Caribbean, the CARICOM, the Caribbean countries. And we'll probably start negotiating a free trade agreement with our next country to negotiate with will be with Korea. Well, one is the hegemonic party that has been there since the revolution, you know? I mean, sometimes they have won the election, sometimes they have lost. And for some time, one was another big political party, but because so some of its presidents were involved in, in, in corruption charges, the party just went down very rapidly, and other emerging parties uh, you know, are in the scene right now. And so those parties still are not as strong enough probably to win the election. I mean, they have lost the last two elections. In fact, uh, the political system in Costa Rica is changing. I would say that the party in power in during the last election won not because of doing necessarily the right things or well perceived by the people. I think in part won because we had a candidate like Laura Chinchilla. She was a woman, young woman, so it was kind of an uh, innovation in the politics. She was perceived as, a, as an honest woman, you know, as a new generation leader that could do things in a different way. And that's why I think she won. I mean, some people had reservations if the party was going to, to obtain the 40% required. And in the end, she won big, 47%. And her second opponent, only 25%. So in the end, she won really, really big. Well, with Honduras.